today's episode of Still to be Determined, we're going to talk about pulling our water bottles out of the ocean. And I don't mean the used water bottles. I mean the brand new ones. <laughs> hey, everybody. As usual, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi and I write some books for kids. And I'm inquisitive about things tech. And luckily, as you all know, I'm sure you wouldn't be tuning in if you didn't know this already. With me is my brother, Matt. And Matt is the <laughs> Matt from Undecided with Matt Farrell. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How about you? Happy July 4th. Happy July 4th to you as well. Today, we're going to be talking about why seaweed could be the future of plastic. This is Matt's episode from June 28th, 2022. Before we get into that, I wanted to share a comment on our last episode. And quick shout out to everybody who's listening Thank you so much. We've just passed the 4,000 listener mark on this little effort of just yeah. a follow-up to Matt's main channel, and we appreciate the support. 4,000 listeners is not nothing. And on Matt's main channel, he's 4,000 away from a million. So <laughs> this this is the little engine that could that uh, yeah. Matt built. So congratulations to you, Matt. I'm very proud of you as your older brother to see what you've built out of literally nothing. There was no YouTube channel <laughs> until you said, I'm going to make this a YouTube channel. And here we go. So congratulations to you. As a quick reminder, all of you people who are subscribing are supporting us. All of you people who are listening are supporting us. And all of you people who leave comments are supporting us. You can also support us directly by going to stilltbd.fm and click on the Become a Supporter button there. But if you're not able to do that, just leaving a comment like this one from Dave Yesiam from our last episode. And this was the episode where we talked about lasers drilling to the center of the earth because that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and Dave wrote in with this comment. So with geo and solar and wind, is it possible that it could provide all of our energy needs without the need for battery storage? That would be really cool. Matt, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to weigh in on that. My knee-jerk reaction is Matt's going to say no, that we will need batteries. Yeah, no, we need yeah. energy storage. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care how you slice it, what kind of energy storage you're talking about. Energy storage unlocks pretty much everything. So if you're talking about hydro, if you're talking about wind, like any energy that we're generating that we don't need at that time to be able to store it away to use later is going to help the entire system no matter what you're talking about. So my answer is no, we, we absolutely need energy storage. And it, to follow up on that, you are also neutral on what mode of production and what mode of storage you, yeah. I think if I were to put words into your mouth, it would be my brother's a great guy. But if I was to put more <laughs> words into your mouth, it would be <laughs> use the right tool for the right job. So yes. if you have a wind turbine and you use an iron based battery system and that meets your needs more power to Go you for it. and if you have an alternate scenario where well it's not windy enough where you are you need geothermal yep yeah so use, use the right tool for the right job based on where you are and what your needs are it's if it's a battery or flywheels or gravity energy storage or whatever it's like it doesn't matter it's like it's there's so many options out there Right. Pick the setup that works for you. That's the bottom line. And that's not to say that there aren't places where Dave's comment might make sense, where you just Correct. have an excess of power being generated for your needs. And those are the places where maybe that energy is going back into the grid. You might have an energy production solar panels, let's say, on your home. It doesn't mean you have to have a battery on your home. If your solar panels are going to be going back into the grid and you're comfortable with that, that's fine too, right? Correct. Exactly. Thank you for the comment, Dave. That was a welcome conversation starter for following up on last week's episode. It's, but now onto this week's episode where we're going to be talking about seaweed as a potential source of plastic. And this one had some very interesting comments on it, like this one from David Biwa, who wrote a couple of questions came to mind as I watched the video. At one point, you mentioned seaweed, plastic, film being more expensive at up to 3,600 a ton. For those mm -hmm. of us not in the know, it would be nice to know the cost of traditional plastic for comparison. I don't have that on hand, <laughs> but it is more expensive. I can't remember what the exact number was, but I think it was something like 20% more expensive. 
I think that's what, it, mm-hmm. but don't, don't quote me on that. I'd have to look it up. I don't have my notes in ha- handy in front of me. That would be an interesting detail to be able to follow up with next week. I think if we can revisit that at that point. Yep. His other question is what is the shelf life for products packaged with seaweed plastic? You touched on it when you mentioned that seaweed plastic sachets might break in shipping, but I'm wondering about this plastic will break down in two months in your home compost. If product X is packaged in such packaging, does it have to be sold more quickly? Or does the clock not start ticking until it is exposed to other elements such as water, heat, UV, and the compost? So what information do you have in that regard? Is this a thing where it's sitting on the shelf for two months and the store manager is standing there going, Oh my God, if that doesn't sell today <laughs> no. from, from what I found and my team found it's that later comment of it's basically when it gets exposed to the proper, like when you're composting something, it's about heat. It's about uh, microbes. It's there's things that cause the decomposition to happen. If those aren't there, this stuff can last for months. Some of it could probably last for years, depending on what it's made of, mm-hmm. but it, it's, it's long lasting. So it's like, if you're talking about sitting on a store shelf, you don't have to worry about it for three months. It's like, they're going to be tossing that stuff by the expiration date <laughs> of the stuff anyway. So it's right. like, you know, they only sell it for so long anyway. It's not going to accelerate that. Right. There was a related comment. This one from uh, cliff dog zero one who wrote, I think the biggest hurdle to plastic alternatives is durability. I'm a commercial cleaner and have used some of the compostable rubbish bags in the office and they are awful. The moment (laughs) coffee or tea leaks into them, they begin to break down and leak all over the bins, forcing me to wash eight bins by hand. In the end, while they still get compostable bags, I buy the plastic rubbish bags with my own money. This is a case of (laughs) the wrong tool for the wrong job. I would argue that the managers who Cliff Dog is dealing with are purchasing a product in a kind of performative, we're doing the right thing, as opposed yes. to actually evaluating whether this is the right thing. Right. The kinds of compostable bags that they are purchasing for rubbish bins in an office environment might in fact be intended for things like if you're hauling off leaves or something like that, I imagine. If it's well, it depends on what it's made of. If it's because, dissolving like, when it gets wet with coffee or tea, though, that to me says this is not the environment for that bag. This may not even be the intended use. Yeah. I don't know if you've bought them, but like we've tried different brands of those compostable like Ziploc sandwich bags and they are not created equal. Like there was one type that we got that was so like you could just barely pull it and it would start to kind of stretch and deform and then tear. It was, it felt very weak. And then there was a different brand we tried that feels very durable. It's all, it feels just as durable as a traditional plastic, but it's still compostable. So it's like really depends on what you're buying. And it does feel a little performative from the managers of his business of yeah. they're ticking that box of we're buying something green check. And it's like, yeah. well, did you test it for performance? Oh, this doesn't work very well. Maybe we should try one of these other three options over here yeah. to see if it's any better. So it sounds like they're not doing their due diligence. Yeah. And it also, it's unfortunate because it gives then, you know, Cliff Dog is then walking away saying this is useless. And he is then sharing that information with other people. And there may be another brand that would fit the job perfectly, but his experience is now tainting the water. And that's unfortunate. So here we are, Cliff Dog, we are not defending compostable rubbish bin bags, but we (laughs) are suggesting if you're buying things with your own money, that's not a great solution either. I, yep. We should never be in a position where we're buying our employers products for use in the office. That's you're going another step beyond. I would urge you to maybe talk to whatever purchaser is in charge of this. Is there a different brand we can try? Cause these aren't working. Yes. And, exactly. uh, and if you do go that, go that route, cliff dog, come back and let us know. Do you find, have you found one that works? I'd be actually very interested in that. There were also comments around styrofoam packaging and this potential, not necessarily direct use, but sister product to other things you've talked about around packaging and the change in the packaging industry, mm-hmm. like this one from geek iwg who wrote i for one will be glad when we can finally get rid of styrofoam packaging it's so annoying to deal with it breaks apart into tiny static clinging particles it's difficult to compact without some sort of grinder 
It cannot be melted down without releasing toxic fumes. It cannot be recycled. So it just ends up in the landfill. And I wanted to give you an opportunity here. This current video was about seaweed and seaweed mm -hmm. that might lead to plastic. I can imagine that there could be packaging implications here that this material could in fact be used for some kind of packaging material. But even if this material is not, do you want to talk now about some of the other packaging materials sure. that you've come across and talked about in some of your previous videos? Yeah, this is one of those reasons I, I, I keep obsessing about plastic and you can see this in a ton of my videos. I've talked about it a lot, but like this seaweed plastic, I don't know if it could ever really be used for packaging, like for shipping materials. I could see it being used potentially for maybe blister packs. I don't know if you've had those recently, but I've, <laughs> I bought some new power tools and they all came in blister packs and I was cursing the manufacturer the entire time I was on because they cut you and they're like very yeah. difficult to work with. Can't stand that, but I understand why the industry uses it because it's so convenient. It's so cheap. Yeah. But when it comes to like styrofoam replacements, I've talked about mycelium fungus, which is the one I am like very bearish about. Um, you probably can't see it behind me, but on one of my shelves, I've got a little mycelium brick that I bought from a company called Ecovative, which is, can be molded just like styrofoam and to any shape you want. And after I made that video, I have actually bought a couple of products in the months after I made that video that were using this exact product. And I was so excited. I was like, like, oh my God, here it is in the real world. This company's actually using this thing. That's very and cool. It was, it was molded just like a traditional styrofoam holding the product I bought. And all I had to do was t toss it in the recycling bin and it's going to break down in a compost pile someplace. How That's fantastic. I'm curious. I've got a couple of follow-up questions to that. Were these products that you anticipated getting packaging that would be green? No. That's no. nice. That's the, thing. That's the thing that got me really excited. It was um, uh, Anchor, um, the brand Anchor that makes a lot of electronic chargers and stuff. They've been doing interesting things with their plastics are compostable that they use, like the little bags that things come in now. Mm -hmm. All of their packaging comes in just recycled, very thin form uh, cardboard boxes that are very easy to recycle. But this mycelium package, I can't remember what the company was, but it was an electronics company. And it's like, I was not expecting to get this. And it's like a random company I've never heard of before, bought anything from before. And I opened the box and saw the, the mycelium <laughs> packaging inside of it to protect the product and i was like you go it's like I, it's like you're some random little tiny company i've never heard of mm -hmm. and you're doing the right thing here it's pretty cool so and it's like how, i'm assuming we'll see this more and more and more in the coming yeah. years and i'm curious how was the recyclability of that conveyed was it printed right on the packaging material itself or was there something in the packaging that said hey this is all compostable you can just put this in the recycling yeah one of the two products i'm talking about one of them had a little card that was Open the box and a little card saying everything in this can be recycled. And it was like, all right, they're, they're doing, they're like very proud of what they're doing. Yeah. The other company, there was no mention of anything, nothing printed on the box, nothing. It was just, they're just kind of using these recyclable products and they're not bragging about it. So I thought right. it was interesting about the two different approaches. One company right. going, look at us. And the other company going, we're just going to do it because, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> and ultimately, I guess it doesn't really matter because if the material no. is going to be able to break down, then if you throw it in the garbage bin, it breaks down. The with the garbage yeah. and if you put it in a recycling or compostable situation then it breaks down there but six yeah. of one it's, half a dozen of another it doesn't really matter it, it all works it all works in the end it doesn't matter which ultimately is the place we're trying to get to i believe yes. would you agree that that's the place 100%. you want to be able to be able to walk through your house and finish that bottle of water throw it in the garbage can open up that delivery, throw that stuff in the garbage you want to be able to get to the place where recyclability compostability and garbage are all basically things we don't have to think about. Yeah. It's like the companies like Pepsi and Coke are working hard right now on new alternatives to their plastic bottles. And one of the forms that are using is it uses a remnants of sugar. So it's using sugar fibers, like from the sugar cane to produce plastic bottles. And those literally will just break down over time into right. nothing. And so it's like, we're going to get there. It's just a matter of when and how long it will take. Right. But there's going to be a period where it's like, we will still get these single use products. And then you can literally just chuck them in the garbage and forget about it because they will break down in 90 days or right. something like that. They'll just slowly break down. Right. Or like this seaweed, you could finish your beverage and then eat the bottle. 
<laughs> you could eat, you could eat the bottle. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Which suddenly I'm having flashbacks to growing up in the 1970s and those little wax <laughs> bottles of colored <laughs> the, the, water yep. that we used to get that was supposed to be refreshing. They never were. If they gross. were supposed to be fun to drink, they never were. And yeah. I used to convince myself that the wax that this little mini bottle was, was made edible. out of was edible and flavored. I convinced myself of this. It was like some yeah. sort of like I I am convinced this tastes like grape. And I would then chew on wax for a good five or ten minutes trying to choke it down before I'd finally give up and be like, OK, this is just a ball of wax in my mouth. <laughs> The 1970s were a dark time, people. That's what I'm trying yes. to convey. These were... We used to chew on wax. <laughs> this, the era that our children are going up in now looked wildly different than, mm -hmm. than what it was like to grow up in the 1970s when we were all feral, we were all filthy, and our parents didn't know where we were. So let alone did they know that we were eating the wax that our beverages came in. But here, this is legitimately... An edible product. Yep. So I want to talk for a moment about wrapping your head around the idea that you could go to a Taco Bell. Yep. And get your hot get sauce. yourself a chalupa yep. and some hot sauce and bite the corner off the hot sauce, squeeze it onto the chalupa and then pop <laughs> the remains, the remains into your mouth. It's going to be a big <laughs> leap. Yes. For, for a, first of all, let me just say this. Nothing against any of our fast food worker brethren out there. You do good work. It's an important job. I, I don't mean to, to besmirch anybody by saying, first of all, we're not advocating that when this product hits the market, you will necessarily want to eat packets. You wouldn't know who's touched them. You wouldn't know yes. how they've been stored. A box yep. of these things sitting underneath the counter is not necessarily the, yeah, I'm just going to snack on those. Like I, yeah. you know, if somebody told me today, this aluminum packet of ketchup is actually edible. I would not start eating those simply because the people who hand them to me, they're not wearing gloves. Sometimes this is not a thing yeah. that, that we're suggesting should be the norm, but it is a fascinating element to this, that you could have a beverage with a container that is technically edible, that it is something that yep. could break down in this way. So is there in your research, was there anything to indicate that there's a difference between what could be held safely in this kind of packaging? Liquid, like straight up liquid, water yes. or a soda yep. could yep. be held in this? Would yeah, it they need, did that. They've done they that. Did that. Yeah, even plow, even something that's under these, pressure? It will not plow the company that did this for the London marathon was handing out energy drinks right in the packets. So it's like, there were no cups so as the runners were running, they weren't tossing plastic cups. They could literally just pop the entire thing in their mouth, right? Get their Gatorade and then or rip it the open and then, you know, and it, then toss it and right. break down. Yeah. Right. Which then, I mean, I can't help but think it's like something from Dr. Who the street is covered with these things. It rains, they all coalesce into one giant mass and then they eat London. But, <laughs> I mean, talk about, yeah, what's good for the goose. It's it, here. You, know, you were going to eat us. So here we come. But what about something that's under pressure? What about something that might change volume based on temperature? Like, is this stuff delicate if it gets too hot? Is it too fragile if it gets too cold? What are the impacts in like shipping? You've got a container full of packets of something in this seaweed material. Are they going to be resilient in the way that we're accustomed to from plastic packaging. To me, that's the part that's still to be determined to live hey, up in the name of the show. Hey, good product yeah. drop. See what I did there? See what there I did there? Um, Seaweed, it, what you did there. Uh, the, the packets are, what they can manufacture, it's pl it's plastic. So living up to the name of plastic, it is has elasticity to it. It can stretch and adjust. So as the if the thing inside of it is changing volume slightly, it's going to be able to accommodate that, but I do not know how that works for, are, are you talking about like soda? <laughs> like yeah, shake that's it up my, and it like, that's like my really, concern is that it, like yeah. you end up with a product that has very specific use in mm -hmm. like, okay, it's a mayonnaise packet. That's great. 
it's mustard, it's ketchup, or it's something like restaurants. I can imagine restaurants getting things like gravies, broths, things like that, that are going to be able to be like sliced open quickly, put into a pot, heated up and then served. That's seems like a pretty straightforward use, but then you mm-hmm. get into our daily expectations around things like, is it going to be resilient to detergents? Could this be used to hold hand soap, dish soap, laundry detergents? Could this be something that would be able to manage the pressure of a carbonated beverage that those are some of the things I couldn't find answers on and my team couldn't find answers on, on that. Exactly. There was a little bit of a black hole around mm-hmm. some of that. So just to make an assumption, I would say it's probably not appropriate for anything. I mean, right. for everything, it probably does have limitations right now as to what you probably should store it. And shouldn't because there probably are materials that might break it down quickly. Right. Like I could, I could see some kinds of detergents potentially being a problem. Right. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't work for some detergents. It's it's, right. it's a matter of, I w- we were just talking about this earlier, right? Tool for the right job. So it's like, this is not going to be some kind of panacea solution for all forms of plastic. There's, you can use algae to create plastic. I've done that in another video. There's mycelium for foams. There's this for like, imagine ketchup packets. So it's, it's about choosing the right tool for the right job. Right. That seems to be the refrain for this episode. Yeah. So listeners, let us know, what do you think about the idea of edible food containers? What do you think about the idea of this kind of solution? And Matt, one last question for you. One of the comments that I spotted was that about seaweed li- limitations of seaweed, basically mm-hmm. a seaweed shortage. This person stated that there's a seaweed shortage going on right now. I did a little bit of research on this. I couldn't find anything claiming a seaweed shortage, but there was one a couple of years ago in Japan. They didn't have enough. They weren't able to harvest enough to meet the demand at the time. And I think it was 2019. Is the seaweed that's being used for this a particular kind of seaweed? And do you know where it is grown and how it is managed? Well, there's in the video I talked, there's two different paths and yes there are very specific kinds of seaweed like there's one that's using kelp there's another one that's using i can't remember the exact like species of of seaweed but they are using very specific kinds the, that is one of the limitations around this it's not that there isn't enough but it's one of those it's not like we could scale this up to satisfy all of our plastic needs today because there isn't enough being harvested today right so this is one of those you would basically need seaweed farms that would be set up like off of shallow coastlines where you could start setting up seaweed farms to actually produce enough of this in an ecological way that's ecologically safe right. to do this. So it's it's going to be a slow ramp up because of how we have to ramp up production and harvesting as well. Right. So as I said, listeners, what do you think about this? And don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, Doing what you're doing right now is a great way to do that. Just listening to us. You can also subscribe and you can also leave a review on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, Spotify, wherever it was you found this show, go back there and leave a review. We'd greatly appreciate it. If you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to still tbd.fm. You can click on the become a supporter button. You can throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate each and every George Washington imprint on our foreheads and if you'd like to click join right here on youtube and become a member that way you can do that as well all of this really does help support the show thank you so much for listening everybody and we'll talk to you next time